Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm a grad student from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm here to learn from everyone. So please uh, note down any questions or problems you spot in my paper, in my talk. I'll be, uh, I'll love to learn them. Uh, so the title of my talk is Hy Hypothesis and Sufficient Reason in Duchatelet and Kant. Uh, in this talk, I want to argue that both Duchatelet and Kant champion hypothesis as a practically useful method of scientific discovery. In both of their um, treatment, uh, uh, so in both of their treatments of hypothesis, I argue that some version of the PSR is at play. And by discussing the method of hypothesis, I argue that just like Duchatelet, Kant also endorses a version of the PSR that makes use of a relativized notion of sufficiency. In particular, the sufficiency of a reason is relativized to the ends of human understanding. Um, in section one of this talk, uh, I present Duchatelet's and Kant's views on the method of hypothesis and show that for both, uh, the PSR is at heart of hypothesis. Uh, in, and in section two, I show that Duchatelet has a relativized notion of a sufficient reason for two reasons. First, Duchatelet takes a psychological entryway in her discussion of the PSR, which means that the PSR describes how we in fact think and uh, do things which also means that she doesn't seem to commit to a further normative basis for the principle's correctness. In other words, given the kinds of epistemic creatures we are, the principle of contradiction and the PSR are necessary for us to have any knowledge. And second, she believes that hypotheses are sufficient on moral grounds. Could you, could you make a short break until we see your slide? Yes. Sometimes even <coughs> the uh, technical uh, apparatus does not go very well. <laughs> Simply stops. <laughs> you can try. <laughs> So I just introduced uh, this outline of this talk. And uh, as I was saying, where was I? Uh, so in section three, I use Kant's distinction between the apodictic certainty and empirical certainty to argue that although hypotheses um, cannot have a certainty in the strictest sense, they can be said to have empirical certainty when their probabilities are high. Um, and this kind of special certainty uh, that belongs to hypothesis justifies attributing to Kant a PSR that relativizes sufficiency to our aim in inquiry. Um, as empirical certainty provides sufficient reason for us to ascend to hypotheses with high probabilities. And the texts by Duchatelet that I focus on in this paper are mostly from uh, Institution. The texts by Kant that I discuss are centered around the first critique and his logical lectures, especially the logical lectures. Uh, but because Kant is mostly engaging with Meyer's uh, 1752 excerpts from the doctrines of reason in the logic lectures, I consider myself to be uncover, uncovering similarities between Duchatelet and Kant rather than showing that Duchatelet actually shaped Kant's view. But I want to hear people's thoughts on this matter. Sorry, 
Um, no, this is not me, dude. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> uh, however, I think there are good reasons to think that since Du Chatelet produced one of the first fully articulated accounts of the role of hypothesis in science, her prob problematizing the debate over scientific methodology in mid 18th century Europe provided the historical background for Kant's works. Also, the Institution was soon translated into German after publication and likely played uh, a road paving role in Kant's philosophical debut later in the century. For these reasons, we should regard Du Chatelet as anticipating Kant's philosophical position concerning the hypothesis and the role of sufficient reason. Okay. So the first section uh, is called the method of hypothesis and the PSR. Um, so I argue hypotheses are a posteriori statements in the sense that they posit a ground to account for observations of some consequences. Uh, for example, the nebula hypothesis, which we all um, are familiar with somehow, uh, posits a ground to account for the observation of the formation and evolution of the solar system. Um, a theme that it can be found in both Du Chatelet and Kant is that a good hypothesis should be built on the PSR. Um, according to Du Chatelet, the first rule for making hypotheses is that hypotheses should not be in contradiction with the principle of sufficient reason. Um, and similarly, according to Kant, a hypothesis means judgment about truth based on grounds that are sufficient. You can see the two quotes. Um, and in this section, I show that the notion of a sufficient reason is at play in both Kant and Duchatelet's account of hypotheses. So both of them were writing in the wake of Newton's remark in the Principia that hypothetical no fingo. In Duchatelet's time, one of the most famous debates concerning scientific methodologies played out between Leibniz and Newton. At the beginning of the 18th century, Leibniz argued that there must be some mechanism underlying the orbits, so he proposed from hypothesis that a vortex must be in motion to account for the orbits. But Newton argued that hypotheses like this were on a shaky empirical ground. In Newton's words, Leibniz feigned the vortex hypothesis. Uh, Pace Newton, both Du Chatelet and Kant defended the importance of hypothesis. In Institution 57, Du Chatelet uh, argues that framing, examining, and even rejecting hypotheses are all crucial processes, especially in astronomy. Uh, on the one hand, she studies other scientists' use of hypotheses, including unsuccessful ones like the Ptolemy's hypothesis and then successful ones, such as Kepler's hypothesis of the elliptic nature of the orbits and Newton's hypothesis that attraction causes a flattening at the poles. Uh, for an example outside uh, astronomy, she argues that using hypothesis, Boiler can uh, legitimately explain the phenomena of the air pump by referring to its elasticity without proposing a further mechanical explanation of the elasticity itself. Uh, that is, re without reducing elasticity to size, shape, motion of air particles. On the other hand, she also establishes her own hypotheses, such as her hypothesis about salt and nitrates, her hypothesis of a substance that in itself can cause freezing, or the opposite of heating and becoming inflamed, etc. And Kant's most important application of the me method of hypothesis is what he calls the hypothetical use of reason, um, as illustrated in the first critique. The hypothetical use of reason operates by assuming a universal judgment problematically and determining whether certain cases follow from it. If these particular cases follow the universal rule, the universality of the rule is inferred. 
Also, in introduction B, um, Kant claims that his own transcendental idealism has been proposed as a hypothesis, without which transcendental aesthetics would not be able to be established. Um, Kant's use of hypothesis doesn't differ from Duchalet's use at its core. If we look at what they say about their own views on the method as uh, the hypothesis as a kind of methodology, the similarities are even more striking. So as we see on the screen, the first paragraph of chapter four in Institution uh, of Hypotheses in, uh, reads, the true causes of natural effects and of the phenomena we observe are often so far from the principles on which we can rely and the experiments we can make that one is obli obliged uh, to be content with probable reasons to explain them. Thus, uh, probabilities are not to be rejected in the sciences, not only because they are often of great practical use, but also because they clear the path that leads to truth. So, Duchatelet says that because true causes are far from us, we should be content with probable reasons in sciences. To some extent, hypotheses which deal with probable reasons are the best option among what's available to us when it comes to explaining observed phenomena. Uh, thus, there are uh, at least two positive things uh, that she's saying in the statement. First, hypothesis has practical utility. And the second, uh, hyp hypothesis has usefulness in clearing the path toward truth. These are separate but both uh, important points. Later, Du Chatelet refers to hypotheses as the beginning in all research. We can better understand Du Chatelet's account of hypothesis by looking at her discussion of what makes hypotheses different from experiments and demonstrations. So here's a passage. Uh, is there a passage? No, there's no passage. Uh, so she compares three kinds of scientific methodologies. She says, when certain things are used to explain what has been observed, and though the truth of what has been supposed is impossible to demonstrate, one is making a hypothesis. Thus, philosophers frame hypotheses to explain a phenomena, the cause of which cannot be discovered, either by experiment or by demonstration. So in short, only when demonstration and experiment both fail us, would we appeal to the hypothesis. Uh, for example, we don't need a hypothesis to explain why 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true and whether a particular piece of paper in your hand right now is inflammable. Uh, the former can be shown by demonstration and the latter can be answered by experiment. However, uh, one complication in this claim is that uh, some, I was I recently learned that for Du Chatelet, one could also say, uh, one could also make hypotheses about mathematical truths, uh, which would make the distinction between um, demonstration and hypothesis uh, less distinct. Uh, so I, I want to hear your thoughts on this point as well. <laughs> uh, and there, okay, there are several rules for making hypotheses according to Du Chatelet. Uh, as mentioned, the first rule is that hypotheses should not be in contradiction with the, with the PSR, nor with the principles that are the foundation of our knowledge. Second, we need to have certain knowledge of the facts that are within reach and to know all the circumstances attendant upon the phenomena we want to explain, so that hypotheses must have what she calls initial probability based on the initial facts. Although hypothesis doesn't require full knowledge of the matter in question, it does require that an inquirer examines whatever is within their reach instead of making a presumptuous su supposition. And third, hypotheses should not be taken as truths before they have been proved since a hypothesis is only a probable proposition. Uh, I'll be returning to 
this point in section two. Uh, and like du Chapelet, Kant also holds hypotheses to explain, uh, to be explanations of general things that arise from reason or from experience or from appearance. For Kant as well, hypotheses have a special status in empirical sciences. Also, just like du Chapelet, Kant distinguishes hypotheses from other kinds of conceptual tools in science. In a Blomberg logic, Kant says that a, hypo a, a hypothesis is an opinion concerning truth of a ground based on its sufficiency for the consequence. If I cognize the ground from the sufficiency of the consequences for the ground, then this is also an opinion, but not a priori, but instead a, a posteriori, and thus a hypothesis. A hypothesis is, as it were, a presupposition. Thus, a doctor makes hypotheses when he cures the sick. He has to subsume everything under hypotheses and see whether the consequences that he now has before his eyes follow therefrom. There if all the consequences that follow from an assumed hypothesis are true and agree with what is given, then it's not an opinion anymore, but instead a certainty. Since we are not in a position, or very seldom, to draw out each and every consequence, then in most cases there are only pure opinions. Hence we must say that if all the consequences that we have been able to draw from the hypothesis are true, then I have great cause to conclude that hypothesis itself is certain and true. This passage brings up interesting similarities and differences from du uh, Kant's, Kant's hypothetical deductive ex, ex Examination results in truth only if all possible consequences of a hypothesis prove to be true. Uh, but I, a demonstrated truth is something that counts as more certain than a hypothesis, or what Kant later calls theory in the Blomberg text. Hypothesis cannot become knowledge, uh, or what we call vision in the strict sense, because we cannot know all the consequences that follow, uh, that follow from a probable statement. This is a claim about the possibility of turning a hypothesis into a piece of certain knowledge, but not about securing any piece of knowledge. Uh, for example, the knowledge that doesn't come from speculations would not require being able to draw out all consequences. Uh, in other words, to say that we are certain about all the consequences of a merely probable statement would involve a logical contradiction. Okay. Now, section two, Du Chatelet's uh, relativized sufficient reason. In this section, I show that for Du Chatelet, sufficient reason is relativized to our ends in inquiry. And there are two main reasons for my conclusion. First, um, since the PSR is a principle that guides hypothesis, the sufficient reason is defined regarding the practical use of hypothesis, i.e. to explain observed phenomena. Um, second, Du Chatelet takes a psychological entryway into the PSR, so the sufficiency should be relativized to us. For Du Chatelet, the PSR has a lot to do with how we act and understand the world. So the PSR is fundamental to her epistemology. So first thing, he, she says that all contingent truths depend on the PSR for, um, period. Uh, and the principle of identity of in indiscernibles also depend on the PSR. And second, the PSR establishes that every particle of matter is different from every other. And third, the PSR establishes the law of continuity, uh, i.e. the law that nothing happens at one jump in nature, and a being doesn't pass from one state to another without passing through all the different states that one can conceive of between them. Those are all from the Institution, uh, what she herself says. In addition, the PSR has important moral implications, 
which depend on the sufficient reasons always being accessible to us. So there are two senses in which the PSR is accessible to us. First, in a more theoretical sense, a sufficient reason is a reason that, uh, and I quote, that makes us understand why this thing is what it is, rather than something completely different. And second, in a practical sense, Du Chatelet says that all men naturally follow it, um, i.e. the PSR. For no one decides to do one thing rather than another without a sufficient reason that shows that this thing is preferable to the other. This is a practical version of the PSR since it says not that, that everything has a sufficient reason, but rather that we never act without a sufficient reason. If the PSR describes our choosing one thing over another in life, then the principle must apply to whatever is accessible to us. For example, events in dreams can happen without a sufficient reason, because what we experience in dreams are, after all, not real life experiences. Hence, the explanations behind dreams are not accessible to us. Um, that's her own example. And we call an action unreasonable when there are sufficient reasons for not doing it. This seems to mean that all reasons are intelligible to our finite human minds. Um, unlike Leibniz who allowed that we frequently cannot understand things sufficient reasons. For Du Chatelet, the PSR as well as the principle of contradiction is self-evident. Uh, the PSR is self-evident in the sense that we prefer one thing to another on account of the PSR and we cannot force our mind, uh, this is a quote, we cannot force our mind to accept something without a sufficient reason. Arguably, this is also a psychological articulation of the self-evidency because for Du Chatelet, it's a fact about our psychology that we accept things only when we feel that there is sufficient reason. Uh, I think she is articulating the PSR on the basis of her observations of our actual psychological behaviors and she articulates it as a universal principle because once anyone reflects on the possibility of human knowledge, one will see that it's a principle that must be accepted as a presupposition of the possibility of knowledge at all. Uh, in another passage, uh, which we're seeing on the screen right now, uh, I think this passage also supports my reading of the PSR. She says, Now a thing cannot come to exist without a sufficient reason by which an intelligent being must understand why this thing becomes actual, have been possible before. Thus, a cause must contain not only the principle of the act of the actuality of the thing of which it is the cause, but also the sufficient reason for this thing. That is to say, what makes it possible for an intelligent being to understand why this thing exists. So if causes contain sufficient reason, they must make their effects actual and allow us to understand how the effects come about. Um, again, psychological articulation is a sign of sufficiency in reason. Okay. Uh, and in a from a different perspective, given that PSR and PC, uh, the principle of contradiction, come hand in hand as the foundation of all certainty, and because Du Chatelet took a psychological entryway into the commitment of the PC mm -hmm. as well, we have additional reason to believe that she approaches the PSR in a similar way, i.e. a psychological way. Um, okay, there's no more on this. Uh, and Du Chatelet introduces the self-sufficiency of the PC as follows. She says, we sense that we cannot force our mind to admit that a thing simultaneously is and is not and we cannot not have an idea while having it, nor see a white body as if it were black while seeing it as white. So again, 
notice the similarity of the language here. She is again talking about something that we cannot force our own mind to do. This um, application of the PC is largely dependent on our mental capacities. So the principle is psychological in an important way. I read her as having this dual exposition, uh, i.e. showing the power and the naturalness through com comments about our psychology, but its epistemic status is as a presupposition of our knowledge. Okay. The PC determines uh, the distinction between the possible, uh, i.e. which doesn't doesn't imply any contradiction, and the impossible, which implies a contradiction. Uh, a for Tirarai, the PC suffices for all necessary truths. Uh, given that the PC is expressed in terms of what our minds can admit, we should think that for Du Chatelet, a psychological conception of conceivability is a guiding consideration of possibility. If the PSR is largely psychological and thereby the sufficiency of reason depends on our minds, then we are justified to hold that for a hypothesis to be sufficient grounds and provide sufficient reasons. It just needs to offer a ground on which scientific researchers can stand with enough confidence to continue doing their research. Okay, now section three. Um, count on sufficient reason and empirical certainty. In this section, I want to argue that for Kant, sufficient reason, as is employed in his account of hypotheses, is also relativized to our ends in inquiry. Although it's not as obvious as in Du Chatelet that Kant takes a psychological entryway into the PSR, we would see that Kant associates the sufficient reasons in hypothesis with empirical certainty, which is relativized to our aim in the sense that we require different degrees of exactness in different scientific inquiries, um, despite the fact that all inquiries, in a sense, ultimately aim at the same truth of the world. So in the Yakin logic, uh, Kant defines a hypothesis as a holding to be true of the judgment of the truth of a ground for the sake of its sufficiency for a given consequences, or more briefly, the holding to be true of a presupposition as a ground. Hence, uh, here, consequences can be read as exponenda, i.e. whatever natural phenomena are to be explained. Uh, then we can read his definition of hypothesis to suggest that hypotheses are sufficient, they are sufficient grounds from which consequences can be deduced. So for Kant, hypotheses specify grounds that are sufficient for what we need to hold true for scientific inquiries. Successful hypotheses are important because they equip us with probable knowledge, but such knowledge is not strictly certain. We have seen that for Du Chatelet, when a hypothesis is considered successful, its probabilities grow to such a point that we cannot refuse our assent to it, and that is almost equivalent to a demonstration. Similarly, Kant claims that we never attain apodictic certainty through hypotheses, but always only a greater or a lesser degree of certainty. Du Chatelet and Kant can agree that hypotheses cannot have apodictic certainty which only comes with true knowledge in the strict sense. In terms of certainty, hypothesis is lesser than demonstrative knowledge, but it's, it also seems that hypotheses are helpful in practical applications of sciences, uh, such as medicine. Uh, in, the, in a previously quoted passage, we saw that doctors use hypotheses to cure patients. Uh, if there is a kind of certainty that can be brought about by mere high probabilities, then hypotheses <laughs> should not be excluded from a category of things that can be considered certain. And Kant believes that there is such a category of things. According to Kant, a hypothesis can be in accordance with reason uh, and phenomena, 
to a large degree, but will still not be knowledge. Uh, for example, in the Blomberg Logics lectures, he says, the Copernican system is a hypothesis. One can still represent the opposite as possible, however hard that is. And as easy as this system is, and as much as it accords with reason and agrees with all the phenomena of the heavens. Also, in the first critique, as well as in, in the logic lectures, Kant explicitly says that hypotheses are a completely special kind of philosophical opinion, distinct from knowledge. Okay. To explicate what kinds of certainties knowledge and hypothesis have respectively, I borrow one of Kant's distinctions for certainty from the Vienna logic. Uh, there are a lot of different pairs of distinctions in the logic lectures, but this is most helpful for my purpose. Um, so here he says, certainty is either empirical certainty, uh, this rests either on one's own experience or that of others, when I hold the things to be certain on account of their testimony. And second, certainty of reason is always apodictic certainty, i.e. that something can not be thus, but must rather necessarily be, th be thus. Uh, empirical certainty is never apodictic, uh, mathematical certainty is intuitively apodictic, and philosophical certainty is discursively apodictic. So this might be a place where Du Chatelet and Kant disagree, uh, depending on what Du Chatelet actually thinks of mathematical truth, which is a thing that I want to find out. <laughs> and. Uh, a predictive certainty of a statement requires that we know all the possible consequences of the statement to be true. So a predictive certainty is not a kind of certainty that can be achieved in reasoning by hypothesis at all, although it may be intrinsic in other scientific methods. So Kant, this is Kant, yeah, Kant says, um, until finally, when the ground suffices for all the determinations, but, al but also not for more determinations than are contained in the consequence, then there is a true ground, and then hypothesis ceases. The ground becomes a theory, a certainty. This passage suggests that we are, not interest we are interested not only, uh, sorry, we are interested only in whether we can derive all the relevant consequences, not all consequences, um, simpliciter, which might be endless. Uh, so a hypothesis can become completely certain when it suffices for deriving all relevant consequences. Since it's empirically impossible for us to know all the possible consequences in empirical matters, probable reason only allows us to obtain an analog of certainty as Kant calls it in the strict sense, which is what Kant calls the empirical certainty in the description that we drew. It also seems that empirical certainty and apodictic certainty has different sources. The former comes from people's experiences to which is added some kind of universality although uh, even though the kind of universality can be assumed problematically, uh, while the latter comes from reasoning a priori and unnecessarily. Since for Kant as well as for Du Chatelet, hypotheses are established from experience, empirical certainty can be ascribed to hypothesis. This is what Du Chatelet has in mind when she claims that Hypotheses are successful when their probabilities increases to such a point that one can morally present present them as certainty. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna skip some. Okay. Now, uh, there's a here's a passage that I want us to look at. So, um, the purpose of cognition for Kant dis determines whether it ought to be rough or exact. Uh, 
and Kant uses this distinction to explain that errors can occur when broad cognition is taken for a narrow one. He says, uh, cognition is exact when it's adequate to its object, and when there is not the slightest error in regard to its object, and it, it is rough when there can be errors in it yet without being a hindrance to its purpose. It's, this distinction concerns the broader or narrower determinants of our cognition. Initially, it's some, sometimes necessary to determine a cognition in a broader extension, uh, particularly in historical things. In the cognitions of reason, everything must be determined exactly. However, in the case of broad determination, one says that a cognition is determined prior propter. Whether a cognition ought to be determined roughly or exactly always depends on its purpose. Broad determination leaves a certain play for error, uh, which still can have its determined limits, however. Error occurs particularly when a broad determination is taken for a strict one. Uh, for example, in matters of morality, where everything must be uh, determined strictly. And uh, Du Chatelet and Kant assert that good hypotheses aim at positing sufficient reasons slash grounds that are sufficient in some sense. Adopting this distinction, I argue that for Kant, hypotheses don't require cognition to be absolutely exact all, all the time. Uh, for example, in matters of morality, we can empirically we can be empirically certain of some probable statements if they depend on cognitions <coughs> that are determined prior propter. In this sense, uh, there can be certainty in hypotheses. Uh, what we have concluded so far is also broadly compatible with the uh, with the pa one passage from uh, Blomberg logic. Uh, where Kant says, the more sufficient a ground is, however, the more will one infer that it's the ground of the consequence. For all hypotheses are posited arbitrarily, namely, I assume something and see whether something is sufficient for deriving therefrom a certain consequence or not. This is a passage that we have seen before. Um, when we are merely assuming there is no sufficient certainty in a ground. However, when we know that from a ground a certain consequence can be derived, the ground can be said to be sufficient for explaining that consequence. Um, the conclusion that high probabilities in hypotheses can give us some kind of certainty tells a more complicated story than the standard one about what Kant says uh, sufficient for Kant in terms of reasons, as well as Du Chatelet. The literature discusses two versions of the PSR, mostly for Kant. Um, one is the causal law found in the second analogy, and the other, uh, at least some people think, is the supreme principle of pure reason. Uh, both versions of the PSR are focused on how the PSR as a principle provides a guide for our understanding, but neither straightforwardly provides a clear picture regarding what counts as sufficient. Uh, by making clear what Kant means by sufficient reason, I try to improve and make complete the standard story. In the Blomberg logic 15, Kant used the following, uh, the, the examples we're seeing on the screen right now, to clarify what he means by sufficient grounds. Okay, so I think this is very interesting. He says, a ground is that from which something can be cognized, and a consequence is what we can be co what can be cognized from the ground. A ground from which, in what follows, everything can be understood, thus one from which nothing is lacking is a sufficient ground and an insufficient ground is one where only something can be cognized. For example, 
When we say that the moon has inhabitants because mountains and valleys are present on it, this is an insufficient ground. From this one, from this one sees only that it's possible and probable uh, that there are inhabitants of the moon. Uh, but if, for example, a businessman has Oh my god, I don't know what it is. What what is the name of the currency? I I just don't know. It's Okay. So <laughs> we'll do a simpler example. <laughs> uh, say a businessman has ten dollars <laughs> in wealth and one says that he has made five dollars through trade and he inherited five dollars, then this is a sufficient ground. Um, these examples show that for a ground to be sufficient, it should provide enough information so that we could be able to deduce the conclusion. In the examples above, the presence of mountains and valleys <coughs> doesn't add up to the presence of inhabitants, hence there are insufficient grounds. Whereas uh, the five dollars plus five dollars will end up being $10. So it, they are sufficient grounds. Um, okay. To some extent, uh, I've, I think Kant is saying that it doesn't matter whether it is actually the case that the, bus the businessman has made $5 and, uh, and inherited $5, uh, which made up $10. It could be um, another way. It could be like, uh, he made 5.1 and inherited 4.9, um, but Kant doesn't think that matters uh, much for those reasons to count as a sufficient reason. Um, I want to hear y'all's thoughts about it. And based on these examples, uh, the PSR is concerned with methodologies in scientific explanation rather than the exact composition of the world. Um, Okay, I think I can end here and do discussion.